It's another week, it's another Monday, and you know what you're here for. You're here for Tommy Coleman's birthday. Happy birthday, Tommy, from all of the Religious Studies Project. Um, we hope that we've got that right, of course. Um, you are listening to the Religious Studies Project. I'm Chris Carter. He's David Robertson. And Tommy Coleman is one of our long-serving um, editors, and we believe it is his <laughs> birthday today. So happy birthday, Tommy. And there'll be more about Tommy after the interview. Which this week is Brad Stoddard speaking with Eric Mazur on religion and American law. So I'm just going to pass over to Brad. Hello, this is Brad Stoddard with the Religious Studies Project. Today I have the pleasure of talking with Professor Eric Mazur. Professor Mazur is the Religion, Law, and Politics Fellow at the Center for the Study of Religious Freedom at Virginia Wesleyan College, where he is also the Gloria and David Furman Endowed Chair of Judaic Studies Professor. Professor Mazur, Mazur, welcome to the Religious Studies Project. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So you recently created the Religion and American Law Discussion Group at AAR. Uh, what prompted that? Years ago, maybe around the time of the American Bicentennial, a new group was founded called, uh, I think it was Religion and Constitutional Law, or maybe something like that. It eventually became the Church State Studies Group, uh, or unit, I don't remember what level, and uh, was a collection of people interested in religion and mostly constitutional law. It was a collection of academics and practitioners, there were lobbyists, and there were law school professors, and it was an interesting collection of people. Over time, as that group uh, grew, it became the religion and politics, I think it's a section now, it's a large group. One of the benefits of being a section is more panels, more time slots, and uh, uh, broader themes. One of the downsides that some of us felt was uh, the loss of a discussion just of religion and constitutional law. I think a lot of the people in the American Academy of Religion are interested in law in a variety of ways, and there are other groups that deal with law. But there are some of us who are really interested in religion and constitutional law in a very traditional way. And so I ran into, at an AAR, I ran into a friend of mine who is a longtime participant in the church state studies group, and we were lamenting mm -hmm. uh, the lack of a place for us to get together and the kinds of people who were involved. And so I said to him, uh, well, let's just do it. Mm -hmm. And rather than going through the bureaucracy of the AAR, which is fine, I'm not bad minded, but it's just a little easier and faster, we, can cre we created a concurrent meeting. So uh, we rent a room, and, and the AAR makes available to anybody who wants to meet at the same time. They charge an, a half-hourly rate, and they'll book a room, and they're very good about trying to schedule you for times that don't conflict with groups that have similar or overlapping interests. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this will be the second year we've done it, mm -hmm. and uh, it's for people not to disparage in any way what the other groups are doing, but it's really for people who have a, a pretty traditional fondness for talking about religion and constitutional law. Mm -hmm. And that's that was really the, the origin of it all, just uh, looking for a place to meet people, old friends, new friends, right. longtime friends, uh, to talk about stuff we all kind of really enjoy talking about. There seems to be a growing interest in the field of religion and law in America. Uh, would you agree with that? And if you do, what do you think is driving it? Yeah, I would. I think part of it is... I don't, I don't know for sure what's driving it. I suspect that there was a period of time where a lot of the people involved in religion and constitutional law, or religion and law generally, tended to cluster around a couple of areas. One was uh, those interested in new religious movements because of the seemingly inevitable conflict a lot of new religious movements would encounter mm -hmm. with the law. And that's actually... Uh, one of my undergraduate professors, Jeff Haddon, his entry into constitutional law and law generally was through his interest in new religious movements. And he became uh, quite an important person uh, because he also saw the, the benefits of the Internet, things like that, creating web space for uh, religious freedom documents and things like that. Um, the other cluster is among theologians or clergy or philosophy people who seem to be more interested in a 
a normative notion of what religious liberty should mean. Um, and I think that's a wonderful conversation, but it's really not where a lot of people are now, younger academics, right. who are really interested in religion in society mm -hmm. and in the United States and elsewhere, the conflicts that come up between religious groups over legal issues in public space. Mm -hmm. And I, th I, I wonder if that's driving a newer interest in religion and law, is people are interested in religion as a lived experience for people, not just in the privacy of their homes or their faith communities, but in the public sphere where they're encountering other groups mm -hmm. and either violence or law is the way that's negotiated, preferably law, but quite often violence. What do you see as the role of the scholar in the academic study of religion and law? Are, um, are we ac activists, advocates, analysts? Yes. Okay. I, I see all of those. Personally, I'm, I consider myself a historian okay. uh, in this field. And so I think a lot of the history has been written colored by the normative positions that were often taken in the past. So history was measured against what it should have been okay. rather than what seemed to be the case in reality. My earliest work in this area, I tried to get at less normativity and more description that suggested something different, that law, and you know, this is not a new thing for people who work in political science or who work in legal right. history, but in many ways I think it was new for a lot of people working in this field in religious studies, that, that law is about power and that uh, the manipulators of law, even if they're not thinking about it consciously, are doing it as a way to control either their realm or other people, or both. Uh, and I think American law reveals that under close analysis. And I think this is not something that's going to shock most of your listeners, but I think 30, 40 years ago, people saw the First Amendment as this bright and shining statement that's issued in the late 1700s, and that America has been this sort of kumbaya kind of give us your tired, your poor, you're hungry ever since. And it's really not the case historically. That, that argument just doesn't really hold uh, right. a, lot of, a lot of water. Mm -hmm. But I think people who are interested in advocacy, it depends on their advocacy. I fully support and am involved in people who promote religious liberty for all. Um, but, you know, if people are, are interested in protecting the rights of a particular group, I understand that. Um, if people are interested in um, historical analysis or contemporary group dynamics, things like that, I think the field is open to a lot of people, and I don't object. I just may not personally participate in the same right. objectives as all the people. Do you see religious study scholars doing uh, substantively different work than uh, attorneys or people with JDs, uh, sure. law professors? Yeah, I think a lot of, uh, not all, but I think a lot of people who are trained with a legal training tend toward that normative position. Right. This is what the law should mean. Right. Um, and many of them are not historically sensitive. Okay. Some of them are, and there are great scholars of legal history who are not connected to religious studies or history departments, um, but an awful lot do the normative stuff. I also think that um, many of them are not trained in the very broad notion of religion that most scholars of religion are. And so they tend to think of religion institutionally. Right. So if you belong to a church, you're a Christian. If you belong to a synagogue, you're a Jew. And the person who's neither is neither. Right. Um, and I think in religious studies, we're a little bit more sensitive to uh, some might say squishy, I like to say liberal notion of what religion is or how it functions in society. Mm -hmm. What do you see, given the scholarship um, with, that's being produced by scholars of American religion and law, uh, what, what are the dominant trends that you're seeing in the field these days? Um, there's an awful lot of scholarship, so I don't know. Um, okay. there, uh, a lot of it is interested in contemporary issues, and in contemporary issues that 
may seem one-sided in terms of religion, but can be understood, I think, with some analysis and a lot of good analysis being done on the religious aspects of both sides. For example, the conflict between the dramatic changes in the rights of uh, the LGBTQ community um, and religious positions of a more conservative or traditional nature that might op oppose or, or have some discomfort with that. Both are grounded in a worldview. Many of the people in the LGBTQ Q communities are themselves personally grounded in a religious tradition, but I think the public often sees us as religious people versus non-religious people, in the same way they might have seen the abortion debate that way, or euthanasia. And I think an awful lot of work being done in religion and law is examining the, the religious aspects of seemingly non-religious positions. Uh, and I think that's great work. I think more uh, a lot of great work is being done in the history of particular uh, aspects of the relationship between religion and law. I think a lot of overlooked figures in American history are uh, receiving a second look. Um, and I find that particularly interesting. Sometimes it's hard to know if I'm just discovering this because now I'm interested in a particular topic and so I start looking it up. Yeah. But there's a lot of great stuff out there that more people are producing. And it seems to be a much more... Um, vibrant field right. from people in religious studies and even people from history, American history, legal history. And also, you know, I really don't want to be seen as uh, uh, putting down people with legal training. Um, a lot of great work being done in law schools and among people with legal training in the history of some of these disputes. Do you see any uh, tension or any potential drawbacks to religious studies, study scholars studying law, given that we don't have a background in formal legal training? Is that a benefit, a liability, well, both? I think it's a little bit of both. Right. Um, I think that the, the normative position about, say, religious liberty or the First Amendment was created by people who had, or a generation who had, uh, you know, really fine motives but not a lot of understanding about how the law actually works as an arena of conflict negotiation. Right. And so they were, and many of them I consider to be theologians because they were, you know, postulating a theology of the First Amendment, whether they were theologians themselves in their training or not. Right. Um, they were developing a theology of the First Amendment, mm -hmm. like it's the greatest statement from God since, you know, sliced bread or something. But... Um, I think more and more students of religious studies are, and I like to put myself in this category as a student of religious studies, constantly learning. And so we understand that religious studies is not limited to a particular corpus, and that if you need to learn something about torts, you go out and you learn something about torts or prison law or, uh, you know, I'm working on a piece where I had to do a little investigating about admiralty law. I didn't know, I, you know, I didn't start off with any knowledge of admiralty law, but I knew it was something I needed to learn, so I'd learned it. And I think more and more scholars of religious studies are open to that because more and more students of, you know, whether they're grad students or, or uh, professionals, realize that religious studies topics pervade society. And so if you need to learn something about geology or geography or, you know, linguistics or whatever, that's what you do. Uh, and that's part of being in religious studies. And so I think that's a benefit. On the other hand, I do think there's some pushback from attorneys or people with a legal training to say, well, what the hell do you know about the law? Right. Of course, we could say the same thing. Well, what the hell do you know about religion? I once had a law student say to me, well, I know about secular humanism because I wrote a paper about it as an undergrad. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that makes me an expert in so many topics. You know, it makes me a, a, a Thomas Hardy scholar. Right. Um, I thought that was a little, you know, over, overstep there. But that's some of the pushback. But I think a lot of attorneys appreciate a willingness to learn. And attorneys... Law professors, legal scholars appreciate when religious studies people say, look, I know I don't know about this, but I know about this. How can I put this together? You know, and what do I need to learn to fill it out? Okay. 
It seems to me, and you can tell me if you agree or disagree with this, but it seems to me that uh, in the country today we're having a more robust conversation about the limits of religious freedom or acknowledging that there should be limits to religious freedom in a way we previously didn't. So specifically, I'm thinking of the reaction to Indiana's Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Yeah. I'm thinking about the reaction to Kim Davis. Um, that there's, uh, It seems like in the past we would say um, you know, maybe someone is doing something that we disagree with, and we would say, no, that's not religious. But now we're acknowledging that people are doing religious things, and we're just saying, no, you shouldn't do that. Yeah. Uh, do you agree with that statement? That they shouldn't do it? No, 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 that uh, we're having that, that conversation. Yeah. That well, I think we are more... having a conversation. I think, unfortunately, it's a lot of yelling. We get... I don't know if I'd consider it a dialogue, but I think two, two sides that's are fair. speaking. Right. Um, I think part of the, you know, uh, one of the great experiences of my life was being one of the lobbyists involved in the... Um, writing and initial promotion of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And... Can you introduce... Uh, in oh, case, sure, in case sure, listeners sure, don't sure. are familiar with RIFRA. Yeah, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA, um, was a response to a Supreme Court decision that seemed to change the nature of how the court and therefore the federal government would understand religious liberty litigation. For about... 40 years or so, the court had said, if the law, if someone can say that the law has a, a sincere impact on your religious practice, then the state has to prove that the law is necessary for some overarching purpose, and that you couldn't write a more narrowly tailored law to suit the same purpose. Um, and the court in uh, a decision called the Smith decision involving a Native American man who was fired for, for having used peyote while not on the job um, and couldn't collect unemployment because he'd been fired for breaking the law. And what was his job? Well, he was a drug, drug counselor, counselor. <laughs> which is interesting because um, part of the background of peyote use is that, um, kind of like methadone, it's a drug that has a record of um, encouraging people to not use some other drug. So he was an alcoholic who turned to peyote use as part of a religious ritual and stopped being an alcoholic, which seems like, you know, if you're using peyote in a prescribed situation at a limited time, not on the job, then that's better than walking around, driving around, going to work drunk. And that was his argument. Um, but the state of Oregon said, look, peyote is prohibited. It's a hallucinogenic. It's, it's a, whatever it is, a schedule one drug, controlled substance. And so they fired him, uh, ironically, from a drug counseling uh, facility. Um, he challenged it by saying, I wasn't fired for violating the law. I was fired for practicing my religion. It went all the way to the Supreme Court twice, actually. Uh, came back once for a clarification, went back a second time. And the court said, written by uh, Justice Scalia, that the Supreme Court, it, well, it said many things, but one of the things it said was, religious minorities do not get exemptions from otherwise neutral laws. And if they want an exemption, they need to go to their state legislators and lobby for a change in the law. Um, and so that really changed the nature of the relationship between the religious practitioner, minority religious practitioner, and the dominant culture. And the Religious Freedom Restoration Act was designed to put what many understood to be the, the earlier interpretation back into play. And there have been some modifications, some court rulings that limit its jurisdiction to federal decisions and not state. Um, but in Indiana which was a state Religious Freedom Restoration Act, um, there was some concern that people were being allowed to do things that were con might con be considered homophobic in the name of religious liberty. The problem, there are a couple of problems here. One is that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act was a no-win situation because it was an attempt to legislate a fix to the Supreme Court, which means that rather than a right being restored by the court, the legislative body was restoring a right, which means a legislative body could eliminate that right. It put into the legislature a right that should just be acknowledged by the court. So no matter what happened, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act was flawed. 
but we promoted it because it was the best alternative. Going back to the court and saying, you really need to revisit this, they said no. The, the Hobby Lobby decision involving Hobby Lobby and their desire to uh, get an exemption from the American Care Act, uh, or the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, um, the court turned to a very obscure piece of legislation called the Definition Act. The Definition Act, I think that's what it's called. Dictionary Some, Act. Dictionary Act, that's it. <laughs> the Dictionary Act um, defined the rights of a corporate body, but what it didn't define is the word religion. And that's probably good, but what that meant was in the Hobby Lobby decision, something that ordinarily wouldn't have happened before the Religious Freedom Restoration Act now gets permitted, and that is a corporation is recognized as having religious rights. Before the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and before the Smith decision, that would have been ludicrous because it was a corporation saying, you're, you're discriminating against us. Well, who's being discriminated against? The, the Religious Freedom Restoration or the Smith decision and free exercise was always understood as a problem for a minority in the dominant culture. And the idea that a corporation could practice religion was seen as, so what I think should have happened is, and so I understand why a lot of people were upset with the Indiana is, issue and as a byproduct of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which seemed to be the problem. The real problem is how the court kind of uh, finagled with the term religion. I've consistently said what lobbyists should do is talk to Congress about adding a definition of religion into the Dictionary Act that defines it as an individual. Mm -hmm. And then the problem is solved. Um, and in terms of Kim Davis, I think there's a long history, and the court has proved this. She doesn't have a right to step out of her government job to... Um, act on her own religious principles. She can either resign or she has to uh, do what the government requires. Same is true with school teachers. Same is true with, you know, prison guards, you know, military personnel. If you represent the government, you represent all citizens. If you can't do that, then you need to step out of that government position. Um, and the failure to recognize the, the two hats that one wears in that position is uh, really what gives rise to the Kim Davis position. As a government official, she had to do what the government required her to do. If she can't do it, she should resign. Mm -hmm. And that was simple. You mentioned the definition of religion. I mean, obviously, that's a that's a, opens up Pandora's box, a can of worms, whatever. Yeah. Uh, how has the Supreme Court over time addressed the issue of the definition of religion, or have they? Yeah. No, that's a great question. There's an awful lot of... Uh, Law Journal Inc. spilled on that. Right. Um, and I don't know that I'd want them to define religion because, let's face it, it keeps us in a job. But, um, but they have. And it's been a little bit of a roller coaster ride, but if you look at a lot of early decisions, religion was described, defined as nominally Christian. Uh, the Mormons were kept from practicing polygamy, or plural marriage as they would call it, um, mostly because the court ruled that the Congress had the right to legislate that. But in their decision, they called the practice odious. And I can't imagine a Supreme Court majority using that term about a religious practice today. Maybe they have. I don't know. But it's, it, it, you know, they called it odious and said, no civilized nation of North European extraction, northern European extraction, would ever do this. That's the crazy stuff that they do in Africa and Asia. So they were consistent with American history at that point, comparing Mormons to Muslims and, you know, others. I think by the 1950s, the court has a much broader notion of what religion is that includes practice as well as belief, which means almost by definition it's broader than a Protestant notion. So that Catholics and Jews and Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh Day Adventists have a shot at, at things. Um, there are still blind spots and there are ups and downs. Um, 
but I think there, there are fewer opportunities, sometimes the court takes these opportunities, but fewer opportunities for the court to exhibit a strictly um, Protestant theological position. They tend to prefer monotheism, um, but I think the way the court system works, it seems that a lot of the issues are being resolved at the lower court levels based on precedent from the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, it takes a while for these things to sort of trickle down, I suppose, so maybe that'll change. But a lot of the major conflicts aren't reaching the Supreme Court. Some of them are, but many of them are being resolved on the lower federal levels. Um, and so I think, for the most part, uh, things have improved. You know, if, if we were to chart it, it's a pretty good incline in terms of expanded religious liberty over the past 150 years. I hear that Roberts Court is often described as being the most sympathetic court to religion, or the most sympathetic to religion. Would you agree with that? Well, I guess it depends on which religion. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think uh, they seem to be the most responsive to established religion. Um, there haven't been that many cases involving marginal groups that have really made the, the papers. I mean, they're there, but um, I think they would probably have some difficulty, and I think probably a lot of my colleagues would have some difficulty with this next statement. But I think things change when you've got a court made up of Catholics and Jews and no Protestants. Not that they represent a Catholic position or a Jewish position, but that they um, have a different notion of what religion is in society. They don't agree among the nine of them, right? There are significant differences. But I think just the character of the position of religion in society is very different. Final question for you. What do you think of groups like the Satanic Temple who are doing activism, um, you know, uh, advocating for what, you know, absurd religion or offensive religion, what most people would classify mm -hmm. as that, as a form of, uh, of activism to remove religion from, say, uh, public events or school, sure. I, mean, I mean, uh, city meeting prayers, right, things right, like right. that. Um, regardless of my position on you know, Satanism or right. Pastafarianism right. or any of, any of these religions in particular, uh, I think it's wonderful. First of all, it makes for great media. <laughs> but, but second of all, and this is really a tough lesson for a lot of people, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If you're going to have the Ten Commandments, then why can't you have, you know, something from the Church of Satan? Almonds to Satan. Yeah. Um, because it, it, it's like the... the I have two kids in elementary school, and so anybody who has kids or remembers their childhood has probably been through this. The December dilemma, right? You have a winter festival that's like all Christmas songs and then the dreidel song, right? right? And I've even seen in print a music director of, an, director of an elementary school admit that they throw in the dreidel song to shut up the Jewish parents so they can have the other stuff and there's no good religious music outside of Christianity anyway. What I tell people is, look, if you're having a winter festival because it's winter, great. But if you're having a winter festival so you can get Christmas music in, then maybe you ought to have a fall festival when there's Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Shemini Atzeret, Simchas Torah, and Sukkot all in a row. That's five holidays, Jewish holidays, within you know like two and a half weeks, three weeks. That's a holiday season. Right? And maybe you should do something for Eid. And maybe you should do something for Founders Day and Mormonism. And maybe you should, do, right? I mean, if you examine your motives, then you might think twice about doing it. If your desire is to have religion represented in the public square, then why not all religions, even the ones you don't like, right? As the Supreme Court Justice said, uh, freedom of religion and speech and some of these others means putting up with a great deal of rubbish, right? If if you believe these people are heretics, then you believe they're heretics. But if you believe religion is a positive thing in the public square, then they got to be there. Right? If your goal is to just put your religion in the public square, that's a different conversation, and you should be honest about that. Yeah, fair enough. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank good, you. The good conversation. Absolutely. Excellent interview there, Brad, as always, tying in nicely with um, David's interview with Susan Palmer, which was our last... Um, proper interview before our holiday special um, in 2015 and also um, 
Chris Duncan interviewed Winifred Sullivan on religion and the law. Um, very broad brush strokes, um, but nonetheless an accessible and interesting interview. Um, back it was probably 2013. That mm-hmm. one. Um, so yeah, I'll make sure that those are linked to in this podcast page. Wonderful. Um, I said there would be more news about Tommy Coleman at the top of the episode and well now's the time Uh, i'd like to let you all know that we have decided to give tommy the role of uh, managing editor and what this means in practice is that tommy if you send an email to the editor's account then it's going to go to tommy first and foremost rather than to the two of us um directly and tommy's going to decide how each uh, incoming message gets handled. So Tommy is basically going to be the spider in the middle of the web coordinating um, communications between the team and the outside world. So kind of exciting. Exactly. Um, And sort of in my analogy of the the growth of the RSP, I would say when it began, it was like a a small rowing boat um, with uh, the the, the two of us at the the oars and and Louise Connolly um, you know, shouting commands at us and that, that kind of <laughs> kept it going. And then, you know, it, it grew to a stage of being a sort of a, a nice ship with us on the, uh, on the deck. And, and now perhaps we've retired to, we're, we're now maybe the admiral of the admirals of the fleet. <laughs> um, not actually necessarily, um, on board the ship. The ship is doing its own work and, uh, we, we're involved when we need to be. Yeah. Maybe, maybe one day we'll get to be like just the coast guard. So they can call us when something goes wrong. <laughs> exactly. As long as, you know, all that sweet money keeps coming our way. That's right, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm planning to retire on my um, income from the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it would be nice. Um, we are jesting, of course. Indeed. We might manage to buy ourselves a coffee with their income from the RSB. Let's put it that way. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, just one of one of a number of developments and changes. You know, every year brings a new kind of... Um, we always have to restructure the editor, editorial team, uh, partly because of um, the people involved. People are good at different things. Partly because of uh, learning what needs done better. Um, it's strange for us to think uh, that, you know, back in 2012, 2013, we were doing all of this stuff ourselves. Um, and you imagine the amount of time that took, first and foremost, and how many things we didn't get around to. But of course, there's more and more uh, things needing done all the time. Um, if, you know, as the organisation gets bigger, um, coordinating between the editors becomes a job in itself, which is why we've, you know, asked Tommy to do that. But we're dealing with more organisations and conferences and um, investigating new developments in terms of, uh, you know, worldwide. Uh, representation, publishing, journals, all sorts of things, um, all of which um, adds to our time. So the thinking was this year in reorganization, you know, we've got some very good editors that are that are keeping the ship going, you know, Cole, Yana, Kevin, um, I, well, and Venetia as well, and Alid. Um, but we, need, we needed to, t- to take the time to develop the RSP in these new directions. So that's kind of what the what the um, what the idea is there. Exactly. So next week, returning back to normal, uh, normal podcast mode, um, we've got Dave McConaughey um, interviewing um, Greg Grieve on uh, religion and video games, um, which is likely to be a, a nice uh, crowd puller and also a very just interesting interview. I know that you're, yourself and uh, and Jonathan um, and a few of our other RSP colleagues have a, a lot to say on the matter. So, uh. yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's quite a significant kind of emerging field. It's you know, video games are now the biggest form of popular media in the world. They've overtaken movies in terms of the amount of money that they're they're making and the involvement that people have with them. So they they are a significant um, aspect of popular culture and. I mean, popular culture in general is going to be a bit of a theme going forward in the next couple of semesters. But uh, so, yes, important. Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, Amazon.com.co.uk and .ca. Don't forget about those things. It makes it sad when you do. And uh, thanks, as always, to our sponsors, the BASR and the NASR. And most of all, thanks for listening.